very comparable or superimposable between innovator glargin and, uh, and Walker's glargin. So ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, this really represents uh, a significant, a small but significant advance in our ability to better treat our patients with diabetes. So the insulin analogs and the biosimilar analogs providing a cost advantage. And we need to be assured that what we are providing as biosimilar performs as well as the innovator insulin. So with this, uh, uh, maybe I'll go on to the last part. Maybe if we can make it a little bit more interactive now. And, and so it, it gives us an, me an idea to appreciate how we treat diabetes across at least different countries. So let's say this is a 52-year-old lady with type 2 diabetes for 12 years, relatively asymptomatic. And BMI of about 23 is not uncommon, at least in India. Uh, already on full dose of metformin, full dose of glycoside XR, and pioglitazone is still available and used significantly in India. Is it used here, pioglitazone? Do you use? Okay. And the A1C is 8.9. So would anyone suggest what should we do now? Do we add a fourth oral agent? What do we do? Any suggestions will be welcome. Any suggestions? No? Okay. So, so probably at this point of time, adding, adding another oral agent will not serve the purpose because the A1C is significantly way off our target of, let's say, 7%. And each of the other agents that we can think of, whether the gliptins or the flozins, maybe we'll get it down by about 0.8% or 1%. So obviously, insulin would be a choice here. Now, then when we think of the choice of insulin, is there a way that we can decide which insulin to use? By and large, possibly, most people would be starting off with a basal insulin at this point of time on top of the existing oral agents. However, there may be differences in the fasting and postprandial glucose levels providing the same A1C. For example, if someone has a relatively high-ish fasting glucose values compared to the postprandial, and there may be some who have a relatively lower fasting and relatively higher postprandial. Of these two, the first group is more likely to do much better with basal insulin itself. Because once you get the fastings down, the postprandials will also come down significantly and it's likely to give a better A1C. However, if the fasting is already not so high, if you're bringing down the A1C, the fasting to about, let's say, 100, that's getting it down by 40. Correspondingly, we can expect the PP, the postprandials, to come down by 40, 50. So that will still be way above what will be our postprandial target. So maybe in this case, we may be better off using some form of premixed. I do not know whether premixed is used a lot or it's a split mix or it's a multiple insulin dose. So we need always got to look at the patient overall, of course, the acceptability of insulin. And then, of course, we need to look at the socioeconomic background of this individual. And we also need to look at how the glucose levels behave over the course of time. And of course, as already we have heard, many times, maybe a good option will be try and reinforcing the diet, uh, which may work wonders in some patients. But as we all, again, understand long term, uh, many a time we find diet actually doesn't work, though theoretically it's supposed to. So ladies and gentlemen, I leave you with these thoughts of how we need to treat our patient as a whole, not just a few uh, figures of A1C or whatever. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Professor Chaudhry, for that excellent lecture.
So now we would like to ask if there are questions from the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank okay. you, Doctor, for a very compelling uh, presentation. Yeah. Um, my question is, I have two questions. Number one, um, taking everything else as equal, um, where cost is the only difference? Why are these uh, biosimilar products uh, more affordable? And number two, as far as uh, the market share is concerned, how big is your penetration rate to them in the market where there are dominant innovator products? How right. big is it? Right. Uh, the first is, of course, the cost that the innovator company has invested in developing the product. So it's probably understandable that they have to recover that cost by a high value of the medicine that they sell. The production cost may be quite low, but I understand it's essentially to recover the cost that they have invested over the years. And we all understand that in order to bring out one innovator uh, molecule, maybe you have a, they have worked on several other molecules which have failed and for which they have invested money. And obviously the biosimilar, uh, they, they, they just have to do uh, bioequivalence studies and get away with it. And so the cost can be different and why the innovator still uh, uh, sells at a higher cost. The second question about penetration, again, that's uh, difficult uh, for me as a physician or a diabetologist or an endocrinologist to answer. This is uh, related, I think, to marketing skills of different companies. I mean, it's uh, probably not exactly within our purview to say, but it would be good if we could have more cost-effective molecules available to our patients across the entire globe and more so in populations like Philippines, like India, where patients mostly have to pay out of pocket. Are there any more questions from the floor? So I think that we'll end our uh, Thank session. You. Thank uh, this you. session is a scientific grant from Cathay YSS. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Photo op. Thank you so much uh, to our distinguished uh, speaker, Dr. Uh, Subankar Chaudhuri, and of course, our uh, 